Well, God bless you. It is always a joy to come into your homes. We love you. We know God has good things in store for each one of you. And if you're ever in our area, I hope you'll come out and be a part of one of our services. I promise you, we'll make you feel right at home. But thanks so much for tuning in today. I like to get started each week with something kind of funny. And I heard about this lady. She was on an airplane reading her Bible. And the man sitting next to her said, you don't believe all that stuff in there, do you? She said, sure I do. It's the Bible. He said, well, what about that guy that got swallowed by the whale? She said, you mean Jonah? Yes, I believe that too. He said, well, how could he possibly survive all that time inside of a well? She thought about it a moment, finally said, I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll have to ask him. He said sarcastically, what if he's not in heaven? She said, then you're going to have to ask him. <laughs> all right, hold up your Bibles. Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. God bless you. I want to talk to you today about how to handle criticism. Every one of us in life will have times when we're being criticized. Somebody's talking about us, trying to make us look bad, blowing things out of proportion. And these people have no interest in helping us. They're just trying to drag us down. And I've found most criticism is based out of jealousy. It's based out of a competitive spirit. You have something that they want, but instead of being happy for you, instead of keeping a good attitude, knowing that God can do it for them, that jealousy rises up. And the way they release it is by talking, being critical, being cynical, trying to make you look bad. And the more successful you are, the more criticism you will encounter. You get that promotion at the office, don't be surprised if your critics come out of the woodwork. Well, he's not that talented. He's just a manipulator. He just plays up to the boss. Or your friends, they may be fine as long as you're all single, but the moment you get married, don't be surprised if they start talking. Well, I can't believe he married her. She has no personality whatsoever. <laughs> See, unfortunately, not everybody will celebrate your victories with you. All your single friends may not jump up and down when you marry the man of your dreams. Your co-workers may not sing your praises when you get that promotion. Very often, it draws out that jealous, critical spirit. But here's the key. You shouldn't take that personally. Many times, it's not even directed at you. If it wasn't you, it'd be somebody else. It's something on the inside of them. Unless they deal with it, it's going to keep them from rising higher. And one of the most important things I've ever learned is to celebrate other people's victories. If my coworker gets the promotion I wanted, yes, there's a tendency to be jealous. Yes, there's a tendency to think, man, why didn't that happen for me? I work hard. That's not fair. But no, if we'll keep the right attitude and be happy for them at the right time, God will open up something even better for us. But I found if I can't rejoice with them, I'm not going to get to where I want to be. Now, how many times does God have a promotion in store but first, he sends along a test. He wants to see if we're ready. So our best friend will get married, but we're still single. Can we be happy for him? Or our relatives move into their dream home. We've been praying for years, but we're still in a little apartment. That's a test. And if we get jealous and start finding fault with them, start being critical, it's going to keep us right where we are. Let's learn to celebrate other people's victories. Let it inspire you. Know that if God did it for them, he can certainly do it for you. But too many people today fall into that trap of being jealous. There's so much competitiveness and even cynicism in our society today. And if we're going to be our best, we need to know how to deal with people that are talking about us, people that are judging us, people that are even making false accusations. In the Old Testament, these people were called slingers. And the way they got their name is when an enemy went to attack a city, many times the first thing they would do 
was take the stones off of the wall that was protecting that city. And they would sling those stones into their wells. And they knew if they could get the wells clogged up with these stones, then eventually the people would have to come out. Their water supply would be gone. And it's the same parallel today. We all have a well of good things on the inside, a well of joy, a well of peace, a well of victory. But too often, we let the slingers clog up our wells. Somebody's talking about us. Instead of letting it go, we go around dwelling on it, upset, thinking, man, I'm going to pay you back. You're talking about me. Let me tell you what I know about them. No, you have to make it a priority to keep your well pure. Somebody's being critical towards you. Somebody's trying to show you in a bad light. Recognize that's a stone coming your way. If you start dwelling on it, get upset, and get revengeful, they've accomplished their goal. They landed another stone in your well. Now the joy, the peace, the victory gets a little more restricted. Doesn't flow like it should. Really, we all have slingers in our lives, people that are going to try to bring us down with their words. They may be a friend to your face, but you know behind your back they would cut you up and down. What are they doing? Slinging another stone. The way you overcome is not to get revengeful. Don't sink down to their level and start talking bad about them. Don't get defensive, trying to prove that you're right and they're wrong. No, the way you really defeat a slinger is to just shake it off. Just let it go. This is what Jesus told his disciples. He sent them out to the different towns to teach the people and to care for their needs. But he knew they would suffer rejection. He knew not everybody would like them. Some people would get jealous and start talking and trying to make them look bad. In other words, he knew the slingers would be out there. And so he said in Matthew 10, verse 14, When you go into a town, whoever will not receive and welcome your message, when you leave that place, shake the dust off of your feet. Notice he didn't say if they start talking about you and spreading rumors, get revengeful and try to pay them back. He didn't say to get defensive and try to set the record straight. He simply said, shake the dust off of your feet. That was a symbolic way of saying, you're not going to steal my joy. You may be talking about me, but I'm not going to sink down to your level. I'm not going to get in there and fight with you. I'm going to let God be my vindicator. And sometimes when you leave the office, you've got to shake it off. People talking, playing politics, trying to bring you down. Don't take that junk home. Shake it off. Sometimes even leaving your relative's house, I'm shaking this off. I'm not going to drink of their poison. Well, you say, Joel, I heard one of my competitors at work is talking about me. Man, I'm going to fight fire with fire. I'm going to let him have it. No, that's not the way you win. Let God be your vindicator. If you'll stay on the high road, God will fight your battles for you. But you never really win by sinking down to their level and attacking them personally. Rise above that. When somebody's being critical and negative towards you, just recognize, here comes another stone. And our attitude should be, I'm smarter than that. I'm not going to let their stone clog up my well. In other words, I'm not going to let their jealous spirit poison my life. I'm going to stay full of joy. And some of you today, you don't have the victory that you should because you're not shaking things off. You're letting the slingers get the best of you, dwelling on the criticism, who's talking about you and who rejected you. Your well's all clogged up. I think about the Apostle Paul. One time he was shipwrecked on a small island and he went to pick up some firewood and a poisonous snake bit him. The people thought he would immediately die. And that's kind of what it's like when somebody criticizes us, when somebody's talking behind our back, trying to put us in a bad light. We can feel the sting of their words. But I love what Paul did. He just shook it off. One translation says he simply shook it off. In other words, no big deal. I'm not going to let this thing bother me. It may be poisonous. It may look big, but I know God's in control. I know God will fight my battles for me. And do you know that snake bite never did harm Paul? Yes, it was poisonous. Yes, it was harmful, but he knew this secret of simply shaking it off. But a lot of people today, they let these negative words and what people think about them totally run their life. They live to please everybody and try to keep them happy. 
They don't want anybody to ever say a negative word about them. The problem with that is it's impossible. You have to accept the fact that not everybody's going to like you, not everybody's going to accept you, and you certainly cannot keep everybody happy. Some people, no matter what you do for them, they're going to find some reason to find fault. You can be there for them a thousand times in a row, but that one time you can't show up, they're going to start talking, start bad-mouthing you. Listen, life is too short to try to keep people like that happy. And yes, we should be kind, we should be loving, but don't spend all your time trying to please somebody that's impossible to please. Until they deal with their own issues on the inside, they're not going to be happy. And people like that, it's much better to just love them from a distance. Say, you know what? I'm not going to play up to them. I'm not going to try to keep them happy because I know no matter what I do or don't do, a month later, they're going to be running me down. There is a real freedom when you accept the fact that not everybody's going to like you. Scripture says in Proverbs, a gossiping, fault-finding tongue is like a venomous snake. And people's words, if we allow them, can poison our lives. If somebody's talking about you, don't go around dwelling on it three days. You have to immediately shake that off. The longer you think about it, the more venom goes into you. I know if somebody comes up to me to tell me something bad, somebody said about myself or my family, first thing I'll do is try to stop them. Say, you know what? I don't really want to hear that. I don't want to get that poison on the inside. I've found it's a lot easier to shake things off if you don't know all the details. So if somebody's talking about you, don't go home and call seven of your friends and say, what'd you hear about this? <laughs> no, just shake it off. And remember, most of the time, it's not really about you. It's the fact that they hadn't dealt with that jealous, critical spirit on the inside. But we can't live with this idealistic view of life where we think, I'm a good person. Joel, I'm kind, I'm loving. Nobody's going to talk bad about me. No, sometimes the nicer you are, the more people will talk about you. It's because the good in you stirs up the bad in them. They feel convicted by the purity of your heart. I mean, you can, you can go out and feed the poor. You can go mow your neighbor's lawn. You'd think they'd be happy, but no, here comes that jealous spirit. Well, who do they think they are, Mr. Goody Two-Shoes? <laughs> Why do they get to work every day early? He's just playing up to the boss. Why is she so friendly to everybody all the time? She's just trying to get something. Listen, the best thing you can do is just shake that off. Some people are just slingers. They won't do what they know they should do to be their best, so they feel like they got to tear you down to help ease their conscience. When you hear those negative comments, those false accusations, your attitude should be, no big deal, just another slinger. Now, I've already made up my mind, no more stones going into my well. I'm going to live my life free. You know what those slingers really are? They're distractions. They're trying to get you to lose focus on what you really should be doing. But you shouldn't waste five seconds of your emotional energy trying to figure out why somebody said something or what they really meant. That's a distraction. You only have so much energy each day. If you don't shake this off immediately, you won't have the strength to do what you really need to be doing. You'll go to work and not be able to give it your best. You'll come home and not really want to interact with your family. It's because you're emotionally drained. You got distracted and poured all your energy into something that really didn't even matter. And we have to recognize we cannot stop people from talking. It's a free world. And if you're trying to be the gossip police and make sure that nobody ever says a negative thing about you, you're going to live a frustrated life. No, accept the fact that people are going to talk. People are going to make cutting remarks. But the good news is you don't have to drink of their poison. You can rise above it. You can stay on the high road and enjoy your life anyway. I don't know about you, but I don't have time to sit around thinking about all the people that don't like me. I realize every day is a gift from God, and my time is way too valuable to go around trying to figure out how I can please everybody and make them understand me and change their mind. No, I've already accepted the fact not only is not everybody going to like me, but not everybody is going to understand me. You don't have to try to explain yourself. Don't spend all your time trying to win your critics over. Just run your own race. I know I start off every morning searching my own heart. I make sure to the best of my ability 
that I'm doing what I believe God wants me to do. And I know as long as I feel good about it in my own heart, as long as down in here I feel like I'm on course, that's all that matters. You cannot let the critics and the negative voices distract you. I know people today, they spend more time focused on what other people are saying about them than they do their own dreams and goals. But understand, if you're going to do anything great in life, if you're going to be a great teacher, a great business person, a great athlete, not everybody is going to be your cheerleader. Not everybody is going to be excited about your dreams. In fact, some people are going to be downright jealous. Some people are going to start to find fault and criticize. It's so important you learn to shake it off because the moment you start changing to try to please people, the moment you say, you know what, I'm not going to show up at work early anymore because they're starting to talk about me or I'm not going to buy that car that I really want because I know people are going to judge, people are going to condemn me. Now listen, I found no matter what you do or don't do, somebody's going to talk. Somebody's going to be critical. You might as well do what God has put in your heart and just trust Him to take care of the critics. One thing that I'm good at is staying focused. I don't allow what people are saying to get me distracted. I realize not everybody's going to understand me, and it's not my job to spend all my time trying to convince them to change their mind. I know I'm called to plant a seed of hope in people's hearts. I'm not called to teach deep theological truths. I'm not called to explain any deep kind of doctrine. My gifting is to encourage, to challenge, to inspire. And people say, well, Joel, he's not enough of this or he's too much of this. Listen, if I changed with every critic, I wouldn't have a chance. And I believe one reason God has promoted me, one reason God has promoted me is because that I've stayed true to who I am and I have not let people talk me out of doing what I know in my heart God wants me to do. Some of you today, you need to get free from trying to please everybody. You need to break free from worrying that somebody's going to criticize you. And just remember, if you're criticized, you're in good company. Jesus was probably criticized more than anybody. He got criticized for healing a man on the Sabbath. In other words, for doing something good. He was criticized for going to dinner with a tax collector. They called him a friend of sinners. He was criticized for helping a lady in need, somebody that they were about to stone. But one thing I love about Jesus is he didn't change to try to fit into everybody's mold. He didn't try to explain himself and make everybody understand him. He just ran his race. He didn't look to the left or to the right. He stayed focused on the prize that was set before him. He fulfilled his destiny. And this really helped to set me free because there was a time in my life where I really wanted everybody to like me. It's just a part of my personality. And if I ever heard somebody say one negative comment, I thought, oh man, I failed. What have I done wrong? Where do I need to change? But one day I realized it's impossible to have everybody like you. And that's why now I don't let my critics upset me and steal my joy. I know most of the time it's not about me. It's about the success God's given me. It stirs up the jealousy in them. If you're making a difference in your family, if you're making a difference at the office, if you're making a difference in your workplace, you're going to have your share of critics. The higher you go, the more people are going to want to take shots at you. I think about the Apostle Paul. He had great crowds following him. But time and time again, the people got jealous. They got all stirred up and ran him out of town. What did Paul do? Get all depressed and say, God, I'm trying to do my best. Nobody understands me. They keep criticizing me, running me out of town. No, you know what he did? He shook the dust off of his feet. He was saying, in effect, it's your loss, not mine, because I'm going to do great things for God. I'm not going to allow your rejection, your negative words. They're not going to keep me from my destiny. His attitude was, sling all you want to. I've got a lid on my well. I'm not going to let you poison my life. I heard somebody say, if people run you out of town, just get to the front of the line and act like you're leading the parade. <laughs> in other words, shake it off and keep moving forward. I love the scripture in Isaiah. No weapon formed against us will prosper, but every tongue raised against us in judgment, you will show to be in the wrong. We all have these tongues that come against us in judgment, in criticism. But if you can just stay on the high road and keep doing your best, you will show it to be in the wrong. In other words, 
God will pour out His favor in spite of your critics. Now understand, your destiny is not tied to what people are saying about you. Our critics told us we'd never get this building. They told us we didn't have a chance. In fact, one man was at a big business luncheon with all the city leaders. He told the people at his table, it'll be a cold day in hell before Lakewood ever gets the compact center. When I heard that, I did just what I'm asking you to do. I shook it off. I knew our destiny was not tied to one goofball. I mean, one man. I knew that was just a distraction. And I realized not everybody was going to understand. I heard people saying, why do they need to move? Why do they want a bigger church? Why are they leaving their roots? People were talking. Many times I wanted to get in there and try to explain it and convince them that it was a good idea. But I knew not everybody wanted to understand. Not everybody had an open mind, so we just shook it off and kept pressing forward. And I guess today it's a cold day in hell because here we are. <laughs> but friends, your destiny is not tied to your critics. God has the final say. And some of you need to get your fire back and quit listening to what the naysayers are telling you. Quit living to please people. Just shake that off and keep pressing forward in life. Another important key is don't allow the criticism to change you. We need to be tough on the outside, but you have to stay tender on the inside. Too often, we become hard and critical and cynical. If we're not careful, when we've seen people be two-faced, when we've seen hypocritical people that talk behind our back, it's easy to let their poison get on the inside of us and start to change us. But you've got to keep those stones out of your well. You've got to keep your heart pure and learn to stay true to who God has made you to be. I found sometimes when people see little quirks in our personality or even something about our appearance, they start to kind of make fun of it. And very often we overcompensate. And it starts affecting our personality and the way we carry ourselves. But we cannot let people's cutting remarks and their insensitive words to cause us to be overly self-conscious and start to change. I remember a friend of mine in high school. He was very popular, very well-liked, fun and outgoing, but he had a very unusual laugh. It was real high-pitched, real distinct. And one day, a couple of our friends started making fun of him. They were going around the school imitating his laugh. And they didn't mean any harm. They were just trying to have fun. But I noticed how this young man started to change. He quit laughing as much. He got much more quiet and reserved. Here at one time, he was the life of the party, fun and outgoing, but little by little, he began to change. And I know it was because those guys were making fun of him. He didn't know to shake it off. He let it get down on the inside. He started thinking, man, something's wrong with me. I got a weird laugh. Before long, he lost his confidence. He became insecure started overcompensating. That's what happens when we don't shake things off. And you may have something kind of distinct about you, but know this, God made you like you are on purpose. And if people are trying to make fun of you or make you feel overly self-conscious, you got to just shake that off. I know in my case, I smile a lot. In fact, I smile all the time. I can't help it. I've been doing this since I was a little baby. One time when I was seven years old, I was in a car accident and I had this big cut on my head and some friends came up to the emergency room to see me. They were so worried that I'd be upset and crying. When they came in, I was laying there on the emergency room table and they said, Joel, we walked in there and you were smiling from ear to ear. <laughs> big old cut on my head. That's just the way God made me. And sometimes people kind of make fun of me for smiling, give me a hard time. You'd think they'd be happy that you're happy, but, you know, I've heard people say, <laughs> I've heard people say, uh, why does he smile so much? Almost like there's something wrong with him, you know? <laughs> you know, and after my father went to be with the Lord, a few months after I began ministering, somebody started calling me the smiling preacher, and it really caught on, and one day I was being interviewed by this very well-known reporter, and he said kind of sarcastically, kind of demeaning, what do you think about being known as the smiling preacher? And I think my answer kind of surprised him because I said, you know what? I kind of like it. I'm happy. I believe God wants us to be happy, so that's just fine with me. And I'll never forget, his jaw dropped wide open. He didn't know what to think. 
But see, we should not allow what other people say or what other people think change us from being who God made us to be. Be confident in who you are. Now I've learned to just roll with the punches. The other day I saw this parody that somebody made about me. It was a clip of me speaking, and every time I smiled, my front teeth would ping. This star would come off, kind of like a toothpaste commercial. I laughed more than the people that were watching it with me. But I thought to myself, that doesn't bother me one bit. I can't help it. I know I smile a lot. If somebody doesn't like it... <laughs> Take a look at the slow motion replay. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm going to see if I can't get Crest to sponsor this program. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, one, you ought to be able to laugh at yourself. The other thing, don't let the criticism change you. Start shaking stuff off. If you're going to do anything great in life, you're going to have the critics. The slingers will always be there, but I'm asking you today not to drink of their poison. When those stones come, make sure you got a lid on your well. Keep your heart pure. Remember, not everybody's going to understand you. Not everybody's going to accept you. Just run your race. Stay focused on what God's called you to do. If you'll handle criticism the right way, not let it get on the inside, I know this, God will not only fight your battles for you, but he'll take care of your critics for you. You'll live that life of victory he has in store. Amen. Do you receive it? We never like to close our broadcast without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church. Keep God first place in your life. He'll take you places that you've never even dreamed of. Thank you for watching this series of messages from Joel Osteen, enlarging the vision of people all across the country. Well, God bless you. Always a joy to come into your homes. And if you're ever in our area, please stop by and be a part of one of our services. I promise you, we'll make you feel right at home. But thanks so much for tuning in. And Thank you again for coming out today. I like to start with something funny. And I heard about this minister. He bought a new horse. He trained it to respond to praise the Lord, meaning giddy up, and hallelujah, meaning woe. Every time he said praise the Lord, the horse took off running. When he said hallelujah, it quickly stopped. One day he is out riding and the horse got spooked, took off straight toward the cliff, going full blast. In the panic, he couldn't remember what he taught the horse. He said, bless God, amen, glory, nothing happened. The last second, he shouted, hallelujah. The horse came to a screeching halt just inches from the edge of the cliff. He breathed a sigh of relief and said, praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, hold up your Bible. Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I want to talk to you today about giving the gift of yourself. The greatest gift you can give is not necessarily your money. It's not what you can buy someone. The greatest gift is your time, your attention, your love, your concern. When you take time to go see someone, you look them in the eyes, they feel your love, they enjoy your company, that means more than any material gift that you could ever give. And the people that are close to you, that really love and respect you, they would rather have you than your money. You can give them all the money in the world, but if you're not spending time with them, they're missing out on the best of you. When you give the gift of yourself, you're saying, you're extremely important to me. I care about you. I love you. You're valuable. You're giving something that money cannot buy. And sometimes writing a check is taking the easy way out. I know I need to go visit my parents, but I'm so busy at the office, I'll just pay the neighbor to watch after them. 
My friend's in the hospital. I know I should go see them, but I don't want to miss working out this week. I'll just send them some flowers. No, take time to give your greatest gift. I learned this from my father. At least once a year, he would have me drive him back to Paris, Texas. That's where he grew up. And there was this older couple that was related to us somehow. And the man was American Indian, so nice. And his wife and him, they lived in this small wood frame house. And they were in their late 80s and had some health issues and didn't have much money, didn't have anybody to watch after them. And my father would pay their rent, buy their medications, have somebody take care of the house. And Daddy could have thought, that's good enough. I'm doing my part. No, he understood this principle, that the greatest gift he could give was not his money, but himself. And my father was very busy, pastored a large church, had a lot of responsibilities. This could have been very low on his priority list, but every year we would take that five-hour journey. First time we went, I told Victoria, next Tuesday, we're going to Paris. Didn't tell her Paris, Texas until the morning of. <laughs> We got to Paris, and she never did find the Eiffel Tower there, but I'll never forget pulling up in their driveway. They were sitting on the front porch, waiting with such anticipation. You would have thought the President of the United States showed up. They were so happy. We'd go in and eat the lunch they had prepared. Then we would sit there and visit for hours and hours, listening to their stories, the same ones I'd heard before. A Couple times I thought, let me finish it for you. I was in my early 20s. To be honest, I was so bored. I thought, come on, Daddy, let's go. We've had lunch. We said hello. They know we love them. My father sat there just as patient as can be. What was he doing? Giving his greatest gift, his time, his attention, his friendship, the gift of himself. And today, people are so busy. With the technology, it's easy to not interact one-on-one. -on -one where we used to go see someone in person, or we used to at least pick up the phone, now we may go months and months and only communicate by text, by email, by Facebook. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to make sure you're not cheating people out of the best of you. To look someone in the eyes is very powerful. To give them your undivided attention speaks volumes. To let them hear your voice is extremely important. You will never regret spending time with the people that you love. Now, I'm all for using technology, but nothing makes the impact like seeing someone face to face. There was this older gentleman that I grew up with, and he was always very good to me. He bought some television equipment for us, just kind, generous man. He'd come up to the office and bring lunch, and we'd all sit around, laugh, talk, have a good time together. One day he had a stroke, couldn't get out anymore, he couldn't drive, and I felt so badly for him. I meant to call him. I had good intentions, but I was so busy. We had a new born little baby daughter. I was just learning how to minister. Had so much going on, I kept putting it off and putting it off. Now, I know friends that would go out to see him, and. I'd always tell them, be sure to tell him for me that I miss him. I love him, and I'm going to come see him. Well, weeks turned into months. Months turned into years. And one morning, I woke up with him on my mind so strongly that I got in the car and drove to his house. And the lady that took care of him answered the door. She said, Joel, he is going to be so happy to see you. He talks about you all the time. He tells people, you're just like his own son. I went in, gave him a big hug, and he wept and wept. And we're all busy. We've all got a lot going on. But I'll never regret the time that I spent with him that day. That one hour did more to express my love, my gratitude, my respect, than a thousand people telling him for me. I could have sent him money, food, medication, encouragement. That would have been good. He would have been grateful. But it would not have had half the impact of that one visit. The fact that I took time to look him in the eyes, to let him feel the warmth of my hug, to give him my undivided attention, to laugh and talk about old times, 
That was invaluable. That cannot be purchased by money. Why is that? The greatest gift you can give is yourself. You can't do it for everyone, but you can do it for someone. God has put people in your life that need your gift. Don't put it off and say, oh yeah, Joel, I'll do it. One day when it slows down at the office, maybe when the children get back in school, Maybe when the price of gas comes down. Don't hold your breath. If you keep putting it off, you may miss the opportunity. Life is short. There's no guarantee of another day. That visit you've been planning to make, why don't you make it? That friend you've been meaning to see, why don't you go see them? When I left his house that morning, part of me felt very happy and very fulfilled that I could make his day. Another part of me felt sad that I'd held my gift back for so long. It had been years I had been planning to see him, to see the impact that it made, to see him come alive, to see his smile made me wish I'd done it a whole lot sooner. I made a vow that day that I wasn't going to withhold my gift anymore. I'm asking you to do the same thing. Take time for the people that invested in you, the people that made sacrifices, like this man, the people that went out of their way to be good to you. They need more than your money, more than your well wishes, more than your friends saying hello for you. They need the gift of yourself. Here's the key. Only you can give it. Your love, your smile, your friendship, your gratitude, that's one of a kind can't be transferred, doesn't necessarily translate through another person, through a letter. A phone call's good, but don't use that as an excuse to never see them face to face. Tell you something strange about me. There's more than one thing, but this is one. <laughs> when I read the newspaper every morning, I always read the obituaries. I scan through it, and read about people to see who they are, what their story is, how long they've lived. My children still make fun of me. Daddy's reading the obituaries again, starting the day off right, thinking about death. <laughs> but I've done that for years and years. I think the main reason is to make sure I'm not in it. <laughs> but the real main reason is it reminds me of how fragile life really is. We grow up thinking that we're invincible. We're going to be here forever with our family and our friends. Our world is always going to be perfect. That's not the case. James 4.14 says, Our life is like a mist. We're here for a moment, then we're gone. When you read the obituaries, you see people who were old and people who were young. People who had big families and people with no families. Some obituaries are very long with great accomplishments. Some are short. They just list the people's name and their dates, their age. One thing they all have in common is they're no longer here. Their time on this earth is over. And it's very sobering to look around at who God has put in your life. Who has made a difference? Who has invested in you? Who was there when nobody else was around? They took you under their wing. They mentored you. Are you giving the gift of yourself back to them? Some people come into our lives to get us to a certain level. They make sacrifices. They pay the price. Then we take off and pass them by. Now they're in the shadows. It's easy to forget about them. It's easy to not have any time. Too busy, too important, too successful. I've got too much going on. No, if it had not been for them, you wouldn't be where you are. Take time for the people that took time for you. When my father was in high school, he had a friend named Sam Martin. Sam was always talking to him about the Lord and how he needed to give his life to Christ. My father always thought Sam was a little odd, too religious. Sam would get to school early in the morning and write scriptures on the chalkboard. Most of the students agreed with my father that Sam was just too far out. Well, one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, my father was walking home from a nightclub, 17 years old. He began to think about his eternal destiny. 
He got home and opened the family Bible on the coffee table. It was just there as decoration. My father had no kind of spiritual upbringing, never been to church before. The Bible fell open to a picture of Jesus knocking at a door. The caption read, I stand at the door and knock. If any person opens the door, I will come in. My father couldn't understand religion, but he could understand opening a door. The next day, he told Sam what had happened. Sam said, John, that's God drawing you unto himself. He invited my father to church. They went and sat on the very back row. At the end of the service, the minister invited people to the altar to receive Christ. My father wouldn't go. He was too scared. Sam whispered in his ear, 17 years old, John, if you'll walk down there, I'll go with you. That day, they both walked down there, and my father gave his life to Christ. And Daddy went on to become a very well-respected, successful minister, founded this church. But here's my point. Sam didn't have that same success. He pastored a church here and there, but nothing really caught on. Later in Sam's life, everything had gone downhill. He was really struggling, working as a greeter at a local retail store. He and my father had stayed in touch somewhat, but not that close. They would call each other every several years. When my father heard how much Sam was struggling, he got in his car and he drove to Dallas to visit. Now they were both in their 70s. Sam was so thrilled. He couldn't believe his old high school friend John had taken time to come. My dad was very loyal. He invited Sam to be a part of our staff as one of our ministers. Sam and his wife moved to Houston. Sam spent the last eight years of his life working with my father day in and day out. What was my dad doing? Giving the gift of himself. He knew he wouldn't be here if it weren't for Sam. Sam was there for my father in his time of need. Now my father was there for Sam in Sam's time of need. Don't forget about the people that help you get to where you are. Don't be too busy, too important. Take time to reach back and invest in those that have helped you. It may not be to give them a job like my dad did, but at least you can stop by their house and say thank you. You can invite them over, or you can do something kind for their family. This is what David did in the scripture. His best friend, Jonathan, was killed in a battle. Jonathan was the one that really looked after David. When his father, King Saul, was trying to kill David, Jonathan would get inside information and sneak over and give it to his friend David. Years after Jonathan's death, now David is the king. David asked his assistant, is anyone from the house of Jonathan still alive? If so, I want to do something good for them. They said, he has one son that's crippled, but he's still alive. This son was living in extreme poverty, no future to speak of. David had them go get the young man, bring him to the palace. He looked him in the eyes and said, listen, from now on, you're going to eat at my dinner table every night. From now on, you're going to live in the palace with me, treated like royalty. The young man was amazed. He asked, what did I do to deserve all this? David said, your father was a friend of mine. Your father helped me get to where I am. Now I'm going to show you honor. I'm going to show you respect because of who your father was. David could have taken the easy way out and said, I'm going to build you a house down the road, have somebody take care of you. You go off and live a good life. No, David understood this principle, that the greatest gift he could give was himself. David gave that young man his time, his attention, his friendship. The truth is, none of us got to where we are on our own. It's easy to find fault with the people that raised us. I hear it all the time. Joel, my parents didn't treat me right. My father worked all the time. He was never there. My mother had issues. My teachers, they didn't really invest in me. No, they may not have been perfect, but they made sacrifices so that you could go further. Most likely... They did the best that they could with what they had. I was talking to a friend recently. He was the star football player in high school. 
He loved sports. But his father never came to one game, never saw him play one time. But this son wasn't bitter. He said, Joel, my dad was a good man. He spent all of his time and energy working to provide for the family. That's how he showed love. Come to find out, his father was raised without a father. He'd never seen a father modeled. Didn't really know what he was supposed to do. Sometimes we judge people by what we know instead of by what they know. This son was smart enough to realize his father didn't know any better. He was doing the best that he knew how. Now this son takes his father to all of his grandson's football games. They sit together in the stands and enjoy each other's company. What am I saying? Don't make excuses for why you don't need to see a loved one. Don't live bitter because you didn't get what you needed. Well, Joel, they didn't treat me right. They didn't make me feel important. They should have spent more time with me. Why don't you have a bigger point of view? Maybe they did the best that they knew how. After all, that's your family. That's your flesh and blood. That's the one God ordained to be in your life. You didn't just come from any parents. God handpicked your parents. He knew what they would have and what they wouldn't have. He knew what they could give you and what they couldn't give you. It's easy to focus on the negative, but keep the right perspective. They're the ones that changed your diapers. They're the ones that fed you, clothed you, stayed up late at night when you didn't feel well. They're the people that when you were a baby, you spit up on them, and they shook it off and gave you another bottle. Now what have you done for them lately? Have you invited them out to dinner? Have you stopped by the house to enjoy their company, to talk about old times, to laugh together? What if they weren't going to be around next year at this time? What if the next few months was the only chance you had to let them know how you feel, what they mean to you? Are you allowing your work schedule too busy to keep you from it? Or maybe have you not spoken in years because you don't get along anymore. You're at odds and you're just letting it ride. Maybe one day you'll make things better. God is saying today is your one day. Reach out to the people that have sacrificed for you. Go visit that family member. You have a gift that they need. And it's not necessarily just your money, your clothes, your food. The gift you have is yourself, your friendship your time, your love, your hug, your smile, your gratitude. Don't keep putting it off. Do what you know you need to do. Last week, I was flipping through the obituaries, my favorite thing to do. I saw this picture of a man about my age. He always waited on me at the department store. Just saw him a couple months ago in the back of the store. I was in a hurry, but I took a few moments to go over and shake his hand, see how he was doing. Just a two-minute friendly conversation, no big deal. I never dreamed that would be the last time I ever saw him. He had been there for years. Friends, life is short. Don't miss these opportunities to give the gift of yourself. I was so glad that at least I took time to go say hello. When I saw his picture, while I was saddened to know that he was gone, I was satisfied knowing that I had taken the time to let him know that I cared, that he was important to me. My question is, the people God put in your life, your family, your friends, those that you interact with, if they were gone tomorrow, would you be satisfied that they know how much you love them, what you mean to them? Have you seen them lately? Express your feelings taking time to enjoy their friendship, laugh together? If not, why don't you do it sooner than later? I've been to too many funerals where I hear people say, if I only had another chance, if I could just really tell them what they meant to me, this is your other chance. Look around this week. Don't take the people God put in your life for granted. When you give the gift of yourself, your time, your attention, your love, you're keeping the accounts full. When somebody goes to be with the Lord, while you'll still be sad, you'll have no regrets. 
There'll be a satisfaction knowing they knew exactly how much you loved them, how much you valued them in your life. What makes losing a loved one much more difficult is when we have all these things we wish we would have done. I wish I would have gone to see them. I wish I would have taken my friends. Or I wish I would have forgiven them and made things right. Talk to a young lady just recently. She's dealing with all this guilt, all this remorse, because she got at odds with her father. They had not spoken in a long, long time. Her father, in his early 50s, was suddenly killed in an accident. She said, Joel, I can't handle it. I'm dealing with all this guilt. How do I let it go? And of course, God will give you the grace to do it. But the point I'm making today is it's much better to keep the accounts full. You've heard the saying, live every day like it could be your last. Another good thought, live every day like it could be your loved one's last. Because when you die, if you know the Lord, you're going to go to heaven. You're not going to miss us. There's no time in heaven. The next thing you know is we'll be there. The difficulty is not when you die, but when a loved one dies. That's when people have too many regrets. I've heard it said, if you only had an hour to live, who would you call? What would you say? And what are you waiting for? It was a Thursday night 13 years ago. I was home sound asleep in my bed, and I heard the phone ringing. I woke up in a daze, looked at the clock. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. Entered the phone, and it was my father. He said, Joel, I'm not feeling well. I need to go up to the clinic to take dialysis. Can you take me? I said, sure, I'll be there in just a moment. I'd gotten in bed that night at 2 o'clock. Just had a couple of hours of sleep. Picked my father up and got him to the dialysis center. Most of the time, once he got all hooked up, he would go to sleep. And so I would leave and go to work or go back home and come pick him up four hours later. And this morning, I was particularly tired, but something down in here said, Joel, you need to stay and visit with your dad today. It just felt right. I knew I was supposed to do it, so I pulled up a chair, and for the next three or four hours, my father and I just sat there and talked and laughed, had a good time together. He got finished about eight in the morning, and I took him home, and I was standing in my parents' kitchen, just about to leave, and my father called me back over. He gave me a big hug and said, Joel, you're the best son a father could ever hope to have. And I left that day feeling extremely satisfied. I knew how much my father loved me, and he knew how much I loved him. What I didn't realize was later that day, he would have a heart attack and go to be with the Lord. The last thing I remember him saying to me was what a good son I was. The last thing he remembers me doing for him was spending that three or four hours together. And while I still miss my dad, I have no regrets. There's nothing I wish I would have done differently, nothing I wish I would have said. I'm at peace. And I don't say that to brag on me, but rather to challenge us to make sure we're keeping the accounts full. Make sure you're not putting things off, thinking, yeah, one day I'm going to go see them. One day I'm going to take my grandchildren. One day I'm going to forgive and make things right. Let today be your one day. Take time for the people God put in your life. Don't cheat them out of the best of you. Your friendship, your love, your smile, your hug, that's one of a kind. Nobody else can give it. If you'll learn to give the gift of yourself, then your accounts will stay full. You'll have no regrets. And the people in your life will not only be better, but you will be better. And I believe and declare you will live a blessed, happy, fulfilled, victorious life in Jesus' name. If you receive it, can you say amen today? Well, we never like to close our broadcast without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again. Get in a good Bible-based church. Keep God first place. He's going to take you places that you've never dreamed of.
God desires to do something bold in your life, bigger and better than you can even imagine. He wants to make your bold dream a beautiful reality. Step out in faith so He can bless you as you live a bold, confident, overcoming life. This month, Joel and Victoria would like to send you a copy of Living Boldly as a thank you for your support of this ministry. God's got a big plan for your life, so take the limits off of Him. Dream big, ask big, and then expect Him to do big things in your life. Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. God will meet you at the level of your expectation. Request this resource. It'll help you to live a big life. And thanks so much for being with us today. We appreciate your prayer, your support, and a special thank you to our Champion of Hope partners for all you do to make the ministry possible. To request your copy of Living Boldly, visit us online or call us toll-free, 303-690-1111.